is right in the middle of uh, that policy triangle. And ever since the IEA was founded in 1974, just about 40 years ago, there have been two central themes that the IEA has you know, stood for, really, and one was energy security and dealing with uh, disruptions and, and other perturbations to, to uh, supply of particularly oil, but all of energy. And then <clears throat> energy efficiency right from the beginning was always one of the principles uh, the IEA was founded on. There were 10 principles that were agreed on by the governing board in one of the first meetings, like 1975, I believe. And energy efficiency <coughs> was certainly right at the top of that list. And there's been a concerted effort on the part of uh, the IEA to uh, promote energy efficiency. And, and I think what you're going to hear from, uh, from Phil today is that it's been pretty successful. And obviously, there's, there's always room for improvement. I think where he's going to also talk about that. Uh, when I visited the IEA two weeks ago, uh, I got to meet Phil for the first time. I, w I wasn't sure. I, I saw Philippe ben Benoit, Benoit as, the, as the name that I was supposed to meet because he was coming to make this presentation. I wanted to get to know him. And so I walk in to, to his office, and I say, hi, Philippe. And he goes, uh, call me Phil. I'm from Queens. <laughs> so, uh, so Phil, we're really pleased that you came. And given the the, the uh, preeminent position of energy efficiency in what I call the the sweet spot of energy policy, we might even start calling you Phil Sweet Spot Benoit. But uh, we're looking forward to your presentation, which is. Uh, uh, as some of you know, uh, IEA has been doing medium-term outlooks for oil, gas, and coal, and even renewables in recent years. And this, so this is the first time they're publishing a report on energy efficiency uh, in the same, giving it that same level of prominence, which I think is definitely uh, deserving, as I mentioned. And Phil is the head of that uh, division within the IEA, and uh, so we're really pleased that you could be here, and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, and I'm going to actually sit down here so I can see the slides. So, thank you, Phil. Please join me in uh, welcoming Phil. Thanks. Well, thank you, Guy, for those very kind words, and it's a, it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I regret that you blew my cover. I normally <clears throat> try to impress people with uh, my very excellent American accent, not despite the fact I'm from abroad, but uh, since I'm from Queens, uh, you now know why I, I have a, a New York accent. Anyhow, a beautiful building. I know you've recently inaugurated it, so it's a real pleasure to be here and also uh, to share with you uh, as Guy uh, mentioned, our inaugural energy efficiency market report. Uh, I will say before I start, it's interesting, it sits in the middle. I think that's where it deserves uh, to sit, but I think the fact of the matter is one of the challenges that we face in terms of energy efficiency is as much as it provides a variety of benefits, we really don't see it getting uh, the type of attention uh, that it merits, and that's going to be a theme I'm going to come back to uh, in terms of this presentation. So um, the IEA analysis consistently identifies energy efficiency as the major contributor to potential cuts to carbon emissions, reductions in local pollution, and cost-effective energy security. Simply put, the cleanest megawatt hour will be the one we never use, the most secure barrel of oil, the one we never burn. It is also often the cheapest and the easiest to achieve in difficult conditions. But energy efficiency opportunities really make up an interlinked constellation between transport, industry, buildings, and the like. And understanding that constellation as a market is a relatively new undertaking for us. For many years, 
commentators, including the IEA, have struggled to clearly grasp what energy efficiency is. We are not the only ones to call it the hidden fuel. We are taking today a new perspective to energy efficiency with this report, treating it as we would any other energy resource. Indeed, it joins our market report series alongside more traditional conceptions of fuel sources, oil, gas, coal, and renewables. So in that vein, we are asking the important questions. How big is energy efficiency? And what does it contribute to the global energy system? And what scale of investment drives energy efficiency? And what return do we get on that investment? What do practical investments in energy efficiency look like? What services and products are delivered by energy efficiency market players? Energy efficiency markets deliver goods and services that reduce the energy required to fuel our economies. That provides a fundamental conception and definition of, ineffic of efficiency markets to drive our analysis. Like many markets, the market for energy efficiency is as diffuse as consumption patterns themselves. And there is clearly a demand side and a supply side. Some actors demand more efficient provision of energy services and suppliers provide the necessary goods and how to deliver it. Consumers cover a wide spectrum from individuals to businesses to governments and market activities cover all energy consuming sectors of the economy. Now I realize that's a slide actually I wanted to be on. And I'm going to have a slight technical challenge, so I'm going to be turning a certain amount because there's actually a fair amount of animation in this. So starting over here, excuse me while I just shift. This inaugural energy efficiency market report summarizes the trends and prospects for investment and energy cost savings in the medium term up to 2020 by looking at energy efficiency through three lenses. First, by treating energy efficiency as we might treat a supply option. In other words, we ask how much energy efficiency is consumed? What does it cost? What do we get out of it? Second, we draw on bottom-up analysis of investments and outcomes for energy efficiency rather than top-down modeling or scenarios. And third, we work with a short-term focus to see what is driving the current market, what is happening now, and what the prospects look like in the near term. So what you have here to begin with is an illustration, our assessment of the size of the energy efficient investment markets, which we've estimated at about $300 billion based on using a methodology in which we basically look at the experience of public sector funding in particular and the type of leverage that they get from investments. And this, as you can see, is commensurate with the type of investments we see in fossil fuels and coal, element renewables, power generation. And it represents about two-thirds of fossil fuel subsidies. Now, when we look at energy efficiency outputs, in other words, savings from reduced efficiency, excuse me a second. Our sense is actually that energy efficiency is arguably the largest source of energy resources. Now, this is based on an analysis from 11 IEA member countries. And just as a reminder, the IEA, as Gus described, uh, was set up in 1974 in response to the oil embargo. It includes a subset of OECD members, uh, and this represents 11 of those IEA countries. Why are we limited to 11 countries? Because basically, in order to do this analysis, you need a lot of data. And this is a point I'm going to come back to. But based on this analysis of 11 countries, we find that energy efficiency produced more in savings than any single source of uh, fuel. And if we just look, for example, at 2010, what you have here are the figures for 2010. Oil, electricity, gas, coal, other sources, and energy efficiency. So basically, looking at this set of 11 IEA countries, what we find is if we look at the result of investments in energy efficiency over the last 25 years or so, which is commensurate probably with the life, uh, lifetime production of some uh, fossil fuel uh, resources, we see that energy efficiency generated more in savings uh, in 2010 
than we would have spent in those 11 countries on oil imports or gas imports or the like. Now, obviously, these figures would look different if we looked at the rest of the world, in particular emerging economies, uh, because obviously their growth profile on the energy side is different. But we still feel that this is a very important and potentially telling piece of information, and that's what's reflected in the title of the slide, moving from a hidden fuel to potentially the first fuel in certain circumstances. And if we look at what has happened in terms of uh, energy demand over the last 10 years, the last 20 years, uh, going back to 1990, what you have here in the blue bars is what's happening in terms of total final consumption. You would expect from the next bar over increases uh, in total final consumption related to activity issues uh, such as increased population, increased use of roads and the like. But we, what we see is we see that the actual amount of total final consumption, which we feel is a more relevant measure when we're thinking of energy efficiency than total primary energy supply, but total final consumption has not increased as much as one would have expected given the change in activity. And that is the result of two fundamental factors. The first, the next column over, the third, third bar, is the result of structural changes in the economy. So, for example, if you move from an energy intensive or if you move from an economy that relies on uh, uh, heavy industry, which is energy intensive, and you move to an economy that is, relies more on services, what that means is you actually need one less barrel of oil for every dollar of GDP because services require less energy input. So there are some changes in the structure of the economy that will tend to mitigate against the change in activity. That's represented by the third bars over. And the remaining bar is the impact of energy efficiency. And so what we see is that when we look over the last 20 years, and this is at a set of 15 IEA countries for which we had adequate data, we see that energy efficiency has had a major impact in constraining or limiting uh, the growth in demand for energy. Now, another interesting uh, point that comes out as well uh, from the piece is the following. A lot of the time we talk about energy intensity. We talk about how many units of energy are required for each unit of GDP. And what we see, not surprisingly, is that the IEA and IEA countries uh, requires less than the world. But what we feel is, in some ways, this is uh, a negative type of message. We're talking about intensity. We think it's more relevant and potentially more useful to talk about energy productivity. In other words, how many units of GDP can we get for every unit of energy that we consume? And let me just say, I think this is particularly pertinent as we start thinking about emerging economies. Because in emerging economies, as distinguished from, from, for example, in many OECD economies, the focus is very much on the issue of growth. How can they power their growth? And what we're saying here is we think potentially a more useful tool is to look at how many units of GDP can they get for each unit of energy. And this then leads into another interesting more diagram. I'm not sure what the conclusions are. But looking at IEA countries, we see an interesting pattern. On the horizontal axis, you have increasing productivity of energy. On the vertical axis, you have consumption per capita. And what you tend to see, interestingly enough, when you look at all, all of these various uh, IEA countries, is you have a, a general shift, increasing productivity over time, but at the same time, a convergence, to some extent, around three or so tons of oil equivalent per capita. So in some ways, this is an interesting trend. What does it mean for the rest of the world? Unclear. But here is a diagram of what it looks like for a variety of critical BRIC countries. Now, obviously, what you see is many of them are starting with um, consumption per capita levels far below the IEA. But the question is, over time, as these economies mature, are we going to see the same type of shift that we're seeing in many IEA countries? Now, in terms of the report itself, which looks like this um, and is available on our website, I must admit, unfortunately, for a charge of 100 uh, euros or so. Uh, but let me just say uh, one reason we're required to charge it is because uh, the IEA very much wants to treat this the same way it treats, treats the other fuels. So they charge 100 euros for the oil and the gas report, so they told us we need to charge 100 euros for energy efficiency. The document is really structured in three basic parts. The first is an overview of some of the analytics, some of the points I've just described. The second are uh, case studies where we look at a variety of countries. Now, one of the things that we find in terms of energy efficiency and was a challenge for us 
is that if you think about it compared to an oil market, there is no integrated global market for energy efficiency. Now, uh, renewables obviously in, in many ways doesn't have the same integrated global market as oil, but it's much easier to sort of think about what is the, the market for renewables. For energy efficiency, uh, we recognized there was going to be a challenge. It's a very diffuse product, uh, many different markets. And so what we decided to do as an approach was to say we recognize that diversity. And what we're going to do is we're going to pick a variety of illustrations from different countries, some IEA countries, some non-OECD countries, from different sectors uh, that highlight different aspects of what's going on in terms of the market. So, for example, we have a uh, detailed discussion of what's going on in the United States, where some of the drivers are very much market drivers. We have a discussion of uh, China, where one of the big drivers for energy efficiency uh, is the 12th, fifth year plan, uh, which is very much of a top-down approach. We have a discussion of what's going on in the European Union with the directive. We look at the appliance sector. We look at the building sector and the like. But the idea is, through these various snapshots, kind of to constitute a quilt, to give one a sense as to some of the various uh, different elements that make up the energy efficiency market. The other related point as we look forward, and I'll come back to this a little later, is we want to improve the quality of our data. We want to improve uh, the methodology so that we end up with a more robust report going forward. So in terms of the case studies section, we decided, first of all, to pick on uh, a technology. And in this case, we picked on ICT in particular in the context uh, of appliances. Now, this is an interesting market in the following sense. On the one hand, as, as you're all aware, many of the appliances, as they're getting smarter, are becoming more interconnected. And that obviously gives us the opportunity to improve uh, the energy management of those products. So in many ways, the movement forward on ICT, uh, the improvements present a real opportunity to improve uh, how efficient we are in their energy use. But it also presents some challenges and often hidden challenges. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with, in one way or another, the one, one watt standby issue. I mean, you all have TVs or, or stereos or the like, and starting about, I always remember, 10 or 15 years ago, there was no longer an on-off switch. It was either on or in standby. Uh, and under the one watt standard, the notion was that if it's not on, even if at a certain point it needs to draw a certain amount of electricity and never really shut off completely, there's no reason why it should be drawing as much electricity as when it's on. So the idea was that when it went into standby, it would go into a, a sort of a sleep mode and it would draw less electricity, one watt, and that produced important uh, energy savings. Now, that whole movement has actually to some extent been undermined by improvements in technology. And I'll give you an illustration. How many people here, now admit to it if you're the case, have a cable box with their TV? OK, so half of you and the other half don't watch TV. For those, <laughs> so for those who don't have a cable box with your TV, one of the wonderful new amenities of cable boxes or satellite boxes with your TVs is it gives you real-time TV guides. And what's happening is that basically those boxes are connected to the internet, and they are continuously drawing information from the internet to update your TV guide so that when you turn on, you see the up-to-the-minute TV guide. The problem is that requires a lot of electricity. So what's happening, because it's always drawing from the internet. So what is going on is that the one watt standby that we have for your TV, in some, to some extent, is being undermined by the fact that the cable box is continuously drawing information through its connection to the network. Now, this may seem like a trivial issue, but we have, on the one hand, an expected explosion in the amount of smart appliances. And people estimate that by 2020, with the expected increase in the amount of interconnected appliances, we might be looking at a situation where the amount of wasted energy, in other words, wasted in the sense that those appliances could go into standby mode at lower energy consumption but aren't, would be equivalent to 550 terawatt hours per year. And that's more than the consumption of Canada. So what we've seen in many ways, in particular in the technology front, is as much as we have improvements from technology, it also raises issues. And this always for us is one of the challenges when you think about energy efficiency, is that it never stays still. And we have to continuously adapt uh, our understanding of what's going on in the markets, as well as our policy uh, tools 
to keep up with this ever-changing landscape. Then we, as I mentioned, we had a variety of uh, uh, case studies that dealt uh, with countries. We looked at basically about 15 different countries, uh, including regions and the like, recognizing that each one presented its own specificities, different policy traditions uh, and the like, but at the same time, uh, one could draw various common themes from them. So just to give you a sense of some of uh, the country uh, case studies and some of the highlights, I'll focus a little more on the United States. Uh, we covered, we didn't cover everything, we would cover uh, certain specific issues in, in, uh, in, in the countries. So for example, something that we see in the United States and we anticipate uh, will continue uh, is an increasing market for ESCOs. Uh, this graph describes what we uh, hope will be some of the impacts of a variety of energy efficiency activities in the United States on the demand for power. So you have sort of a business as usual line, the dotted line, uh, rising up from 2010 to 2035. Then you have the impact of a couple of uh, interventions that would tend to uh, dampen the demand, producing uh, the blue line. And the other thing that we did, obviously, was we drew from a lot of different sources. So in this case, we drew from the Institute for Electricity for electric efficiency, and thank you to them. A big issue uh, in the United States uh, is what's going on with the CAFE standards. So what you have here is a reflection of what's happening in a variety of countries around the world, and what you'll note is that the United States tends to be below the level, and that's the solid lines. And then going forward, you have targets and expectations with the United States uh, rising up uh, in level to a level that's more commensurate with other countries. And I'm going to come back to this point because it's a significant uh, issue from our perspective. You may recall from uh, last year's uh, wheel, 2012, one of the big conclusions uh, that the press reported on and, and many, many people were interested in was uh, the projection that the United States would end up becoming a net oil exporter. And what you have here is uh, a description of that uh, impact. Uh, here you, you see the import side dropping substantially from 2011 into 2020 and beyond into 2025. And from the green line, you see the impact of energy efficiency uh, uh, operations activities on the import requirements of the United States, most notably relating to uh, the change in CAFE standards. And when we look at the United States, we feel there are a variety of uh, factors that would tend to push a greater uh, expansion of the energy efficiency market, which we call tailwinds, and a variety of factors uh, that might dampen that. So uh, for example, uh, increasing consensus on the importance of this issue, uh, the fact that technologies are improving, excuse me. Uh, um, Improved coordination, that's often a critical issue when it comes to energy efficiency, in particular across different governmental levels. But headwinds might be, for example, no natural, low natural uh, gas prices and the like, uh, because what we tend to see is the, the level of energy prices themselves will have an impact on the uh, interest of notably consumers and others uh, to move forward with energy efficient uh, investments. As I mentioned, we looked at a variety of countries, and each of the country, from each of the countries, we tried to draw uh, different uh, important illustrations. So we looked at Japan, and one of the key uh, programs in Japan is their top runner uh, program in energy efficiency that applies to a variety of uh, uh, appliances. Uh, and what's notable about this program is this notion of a drive toward the top, where basically the highest standards tend to set the standards going forward. Uh, so you see some important uh, appliances, and obviously you see certain cultural dimensions here. So you have television, personal computers, and warming toilet seats as well. But uh, I think one thing that's uh, notable here is uh, how many people here, you don't have to raise your hand for this, but own a product that was made by a Japanese company. Well, many of you do. So what's interesting is when Japan actually adopts this top runner program, it has an impact on all their appliances uh, and all their products, and then that has a global impact uh, on, on consumers. So what happens in a particular country like Japan uh, at, on the energy efficiency side has a beneficial spillover uh, globally. 
Korea is another country that is being very aggressive, uh, coming to the party probably a little later than Japan, but in promoting and pushing energy efficiency. Uh, it's got an aggressive program to support ESCOs. Uh, and what you see here at the bottom is also a burgeoning program to promote more efficient vehicles. The EU is uh, interesting as well because um, what you see here in the top right-hand side uh, is that the European Union, the energy intensity of the European Union is actually relatively low, not only compared to IA member countries, but also compared to the world average. But having said that, the European Union uh, has been uh, very adamant in trying to reduce uh, its uh, primary energy use. Part of that it arguably relates to some energy security issues. Uh, as you may know, over the last couple of years at various points, Europe has faced uh, um, shut off of gas, uh, either because of an issue between Russia and Ukraine or Belarus and the like. So energy security issues are often a major point for Europe. But also Europe has been a leader in a variety of other fronts, including on greenhouse gas uh, uh, mitigation. Uh, but in any event, uh, they adopted a directive by which by 2020, uh, they need to have reduced their primary energy uh, use by 20 percent compared to a baseline. And you hear, see that reflected uh, in this graph here on the lower left-hand side. So the top line, a business as usual case, the bottom line, where they want to be by 2020. And what's interesting is the red line in the middle is where they probably were in 2009. After some very difficult negotiations uh, of the last 18 months, they came to some agreements. But those agreements are anticipated to only produce benefits that are more in the gray area. So a lot of people expect that in two or three years, they're going to have to come back to this issue and push for more aggressive uh, mandates and programs in order to get all the way down uh, to the red line. Any a sense of what's going on in Europe? And in Europe, a lot of energy efficiency act, uh, actions are driven by uh, decisions by the European Parliament and the European Commission. China, we took a look at China. Uh, and we looked at China for two reasons. One reason is because it's China, and it's obviously a, uh, a major uh, consumer uh, of, of energy, and so very important when we think about global energy issues. But we also looked at China uh, because we wanted to highlight the importance of supply-side efficiency. A lot of time in OECD countries and the like, there's a tendency to look at energy efficiency interventions relating to end users. How can the consumer be more efficient in their use of energy? Uh, but in many countries, in particular in emerging economies, uh, you often have inefficiencies in terms of how energy itself is generated. Uh, and what you have here, at least on the coal side, uh, is a description of how uh, China is moving to more efficient coal uh, technologies. But again, from a global perspective, uh, beyond the issue of how uh, consuming end user uh, energy efficiency opportunities, uh, they are often very interested in how they can improve supply side energy efficiency areas. And then an illustration of South Africa here, what you have is a very uh, uh, nice diagram that shows a, a, a relatively comprehensive program that ESCOM, which is the utility uh, in South Africa, has put in place to promote end user programs. And part of the purpose of, of this, the reason I put up this slide, is really also to convey the message. On the one hand, we see a lot of innovative thinking uh, in emerging economies, and we are very much moving into a world and have moved into a world in which IEA member countries can learn from emerging economies uh, and vice versa. So in terms of prospects uh, looking forward, uh, we feel that energy efficiency markets are expected to grow. Uh, in the short term. Uh, we see a lot of this growth coming from uh, private investment catalyzed by uh, uh, government policies. Uh, end use energy price uh, is a key driver, so it's a combination of policies uh, and prices. Uh, but one of the fundamental issues and challenges that we faced in preparing this report uh, is the issue of limited data availability. We'd love to move to a point where next time we won't be talking about the 11 countries and what has been the impact, but we can talk about 15, 25, 30. Uh, and we feel, we, we feel very much that this energy efficiency market report will provide a vehicle for us to improve uh, the quality of data and to encourage others uh, to do so as well. Looking ahead, we plan on doing this every single year, so we'll have one next year in 2014, and I hope you'll invite me back. Some of the issues we plan on looking at in that case in particular are, is to look at uh, uh, 
energy efficiency relating to electricity specifically. One reason we want to look at that is that the, our current projections in terms of electricity demand in OECD countries is that's going to stay relatively flat. It might increase actually because of uh, increased use of electric, electric vehicles, but otherwise it will stay relatively flat, diminishing in some cases. So there's a question of what is going to be the interplay between that kind of dynamic uh, and improvements uh, in energy efficiency. We want to uh, uh, continue to work on and deepen our country-specific knowledge. We will continue uh, a technology uh, focus. Uh, my preference probably would be to do transport, but we may do transport of buildings that would then look at it at more of a global level. Uh, and clearly what we're doing is working with our member countries to improve the quality of data uh, that they're generating. So, in summary, it's a big market in terms of investments. It's a big market in terms of the outputs. Policy and the current high energy price environment and expectations that we're going to remain at prices consistent with that is also a driver. Many, many countries have energy efficiency policies and are looking at deepening and expanding those energy efficiency policies. Energy efficiency has a variety of important impacts on the global economy that go well beyond simply energy savings and greenhouse gas mitigation. I'll come back to that in a second. And we see a market that is going to grow. So that is an overview of what the market report looks like. But what I'd like to do now is spend a few moments describing to you why we did the market report. So the first thing is we see a, ver a variety of benefits from energy efficiency. And one thing that we have done is we have started um, a work stream called the multiple benefits of energy efficiency. Because we believe that in order to scale up energy efficiency, we need to move beyond a highly technical analysis that is directed at ministries of energy and the like into one that engages a variety of other key stakeholders. So for example, when we're talking about emerging economies and developing countries, energy efficiency can improve affordability. That's a major concern for them. It can support a variety of development uh, opportunities. As I had mentioned a little earlier, when you're thinking about the European Union or a variety of island states and the like, energy efficiency can reduce the need for fuel imports and thereby support uh, energy security objectives. What we want to do is engage in a practice in which we identify and analyze a variety of different benefits from energy efficiency to enable uh, energy ministries and other stakeholders to engage with a broader range of actors who see their own interests being served by energy efficiency. Second related point, this is a projection of where we feel the demand for energy at a global level will go given current policy. So basically going from about 14,000 million tons of oil equivalent uh, to above 17,000. At the IA, you, you may recall last year, the, um, the, the, um, the IEA did an analysis and it looked at uh, what was the potential of economically viable energy efficiency uh, operations and what were we doing relative to that. So just to be clear, not looking at what would technically be feasible, but rather within the range of what was technically feasible, taking certain assumptions regarding energy prices, taking assumptions, uh, setting up certain parameters regarding payback periods, identifying what are the amount of efficiency operations activities that we could do and what would be the impact of that. And that was called the efficient world scenario. And what you have here is what the efficient world scenario uh, would look like, which would be the green line, and how much it would use the need for coal, oil, gas, and other sources. So again, another benefit, and in some ways the clearest benefit of energy efficiency. We would need less coal, we would need less oil, we would need less gas. And obviously, that will also have an impact on the price of oil. So under our analysis, we would expect that the price of oil would be $15 less by 2035 if we actually implemented all of the energy efficiency activities that make sense from an economic perspective. So that's another important benefit from energy efficiency. Related to that, uh, we worked together with the OECD and looked at what would be the impact on economic growth. 
would it be positive or negative, uh, given the fact that we would be pouring money into energy efficiency activities? And the conclusion was that you see reflected in this graph is if you look across a variety of countries, you see a positive impact on GDP growth in these various countries to different levels. Now, obviously, let me just also uh, say something, which is the IA does a certain amount of forecasting and projections, but the IA does more scenario analysis. So putting together not so much what the world is going to look like, but saying, if you did certain things under certain assumptions, this is what might be the result. Uh, in this regard, what we see often, and this is relevant in terms of the language issue, we see a variety of different benefits, but what we see is different stakeholders focusing in on different types of benefits. So as I'd mentioned in the EU, a lot of the discussions around energy efficiency, energy security, but also greenhouse gas mitigation, climate change mitigation. Uh, I was at a presentation uh, relating to, uh, from the uh, climate negotiators, and the representative from India was talking about the importance of energy efficiency. And she stated clearly, energy efficiency is very important for us. We want to do more of it. Why? It, it reduces poverty and will support our development. Greenhouse gas uh, uh, abatement was not a, 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 a principal or secondary objective uh, from her perspective. So a recognition, a variety of, of benefits and different benefits uh, to, for different people and adapting one's language to that is important. And obviously one of the big issues is greenhouse gas emissions abatement. So what you have here, and let me just point out on the, oh, sorry, on the right hand side is you have emissions. So uh, before I showed you our expectation in terms of what would happen in terms of energy demand, that was the new policy scenario, here's our projection as to what we think will happen in terms of emissions if current policies are implemented. And that is consistent with a uh, chain, an increase in a global average temperature of about four degrees. Now the UNFCCC and scientists point to two degrees as a threshold, so this is high. And we would like to theoretically be more along the green line. And in order to get there, we have to undertake a variety of investments in a variety of different activities. And under the IEA scenario analysis, here is a, a constellation of activities that would allow us to reduce our emissions from where we seem to be heading down to where we need to head. And within that, you see a lot in terms of energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is a major part of our efforts in terms of greenhouse gas abatement, and all the more so when we think about what's going on in emerging economies, because there are two very important dynamics going on in large emerging economies. The first is they are growing, and the second is there are more people. And there's a tendency to see more energy use when you have more people, and there's a tendency uh, to see more energy use when your economy grows. So the whole issue of uh, mitigation, figuring out ways to allow economies to grow to serve more people while using less energy, i.e. energy efficiency, is a big part of the solution. But what we see is underinvestment. So what we have here is, remember I told you about the analysis that the IEA did in terms of um, economically viable investments, which is, represents 100%, versus what we think will be the amount of investments under current policies, and that represents the solid bars. And what you see is different percentages. So relatively low in buildings, higher in industry, but basically the point is what's above represents unused, underutilized potential investments that make sense from an economic perspective. So uh, not only would we want to do more, there's a lot more that we can do that, make, that makes economic sense. So in order to do this, uh, with the I have thought about Three, we're implementing three, and I call non-conventional, because everybody loves to talk about non-conventional oil and gas, but non-conventional strategies. So the first is, coming back to this point about multiple benefits, focusing on the issue of multiple benefits, figuring out a way to engage with a variety of different stakeholders at the national level, at the sectoral level and the like, to get them engaged in supporting ministries and others in promoting energy efficiency. But we also recognize that we need to look beyond stakeholders. We need to look also at the public at large. I am often, uh, I said to my colleagues who work on renewables, that I'm jealous of my colleagues who work on renewables. Because one thing that they managed to do was they managed to capture the imagination of the public. 
I can't tell you the number of times uh, my daughter would come to me and have a question about renewables and how wonderful it was and the like. And even when you think about, for example, what happened in Germany. In Germany, fundamentally, they paid a heavy price for renewables. But there was a general sense within the population that this was part of the social contract that they felt it was reasonable for them to undertake. Uh, and so that type of support in the public for something like renewables has had a major impact in promoting and supporting uh, policies on the renewable side. We need to move to that on the energy efficiency side. The second thing is, interestingly enough, as I mentioned, we talk about energy efficiency versus other fuels. In fact, we don't count energy efficiency the same way we count other fuels. If we make that's a euro sign, if we make an investment, for example, in an oil project, year after year after year, we will count how many barrels of oil are produced. So if that, that oil, if that well was drilled 10 years ago and is producing oil today, we'll count it. Even if that were a renewable power project, every year that it produces a kilowatt hour, we count that investment. 10 years later, 12 years later, hydropower projects, 40 years later. Think about what happens really on the energy efficiency side. You have, a cafe, you have an improvement in fuel efficiency in cars, 2010. We forget about it almost immediately. But the fact of the matter is, it keeps on producing benefits year after year after year after year. And that was what was reflected in that slide I showed you, where, where basically energy efficiency came out as one of the largest fuel sources. It's because we went back and we counted it year after year after year. Now, a variety of agencies actually do this. So for example, uh, the Energy Information um, Administration Agency here at, in, in the US does it. But those that do it sometimes don't market it. So we have a situation where either a variety of uh, entities aren't counting, and those that are counting are not effectively uh, marketing this issue. And so we find ourselves in some ways where the irony is not only isn't there really preferential treatment for energy efficiency, in some ways we are penalizing energy efficiency. The other thing that's also very relevant when you think about it, in particular on this issue about energy security, is that energy efficiency is in some ways a domestic fuel. When you put in place the improved insulation in your home or in the office building or the like, year after year after year, it'll produce benefits, irrespective if Russia shuts off gas to the Ukraine. It's because it's fundamentally generated through your energy consumption. So it's a homegrown benefit, and that provides a variety uh, uh, of related benefits, such as on the security side. So for countries to sort of recognize that when you make an investment in energy efficiency, sure, OK, you buy the appliance, maybe you import it. But when it's sitting in your country, it's generating benefits from your country. And then the other issue is to put it on par with market reports. So we've had these four market reports from the IEA. Now we have this fifth, energy efficiency fuel market report. And then the last thing in some ways maybe to, to summarize this, and this I'm going back to this diagram I showed of, of the United States. The big, as I mentioned, one of the big conclusions or the big uptake in terms of the press, uh, in terms of the, for the WIO 2012 report was energy independence of the United States from increased oil supply, shale gas and the like. But the fact of the matter is about 45% of that benefit up to that point was from energy efficiency. We want to get to the point where policymakers more explicitly say and recognize, I have an option. I can invest in oil. I can try to get gas out from underneath here. Or I can spend money on energy efficiency. At the end of the day, the impact on how much oil I have to import is largely identical. Thank you. going to go to Q&As in a minute or two. And uh, when we do, please identify yourself and your organization when you ask your questions. But uh, Phil, one of the things that always, I guess, intrigued me as both uh, when I was at the IEA and watching the models that uh, the world, in the world, the World Energy Outlook, et cetera, was the uh, one of the points you made was uh, try to disaggregate that total energy efficiency or productivity uh, between uh, price-related 
versus structural change versus uh, policy. Are you, are you comfortable the way that modeling is, is doing, or you see, I mean, when you did this report, you know, obviously you've, you've got numbers and you show structural change as part of total energy efficiency, but how, how you feel, do you think there's room for uh, methodological improvement? I just, uh, just as a former uh, analyst in, in both the IEA and EIA that, uh, well, first of all, we have to agree that I, we'll, we'll group questions. That way I can avoid the most <laughs> difficult ones. <laughs> but um, um, in some other presentations, I have a series of slides that describe some of the challenges that we faced in terms of doing this report. So let me just take a couple of minutes to, to go over them so, so you understand touches on the point you're dealing with. The first one was defining the market. What is the energy efficiency market? Uh, we could have a sense of oil and the like, so we had a lot of debate internally on what was the market. We decided it was, as I had mentioned in some ways in passing at the beginning, when you spend money to reduce your energy consumption or, and this is relevant for emerging economies in particular, when you spend money to get more output from a given energy level, that would represent the market. So that was kind of an indicative of a methodological uh, issue that we had. The second one was sizing the market. Um, so I talked about investments. We need to improve that figure going forward. We need to improve the methodology. I mean, part of the, part of the question is, um, um, I mean, in some ways, let's just take this room. I can't tell. I assume those are efficient lights, and those efficient lights have an impact on the electric wiring and the, and the like. So how much of that is energy efficiency? How much of that is not really energy efficiency? Uh, and it becomes more difficult when you're looking at certain items where basically the cost has dropped. So uh, how much of that is, uh, what portion of that product is energy, is an energy efficiency expenditure or not? So I, we recognize there are a lot of issues there. Um, uh, and then, uh, so in some ways, our view, this is the inaugural report. We felt uh, it was useful and we hope you find it useful to try to sort of change the nature of the debate around it to start talking about energy efficiency as a market, to appeal in some ways to businesses so that they can sort of see actually there, there is money going in and out of this market, uh, and to fundamentally move energy efficiency from something that has stayed maybe too much with, the, with uh, specialists uh, into something that's a little more accessible. Because we believe fundamentally that by supporting that type of movement, we can get the type of support for a variety of energy efficiency activities that will see the scale up that, that we need. Right? Other than that, sorry, one last point is, you know, I, I, find, I find modeling, and I'm not a mo not modeler, is uh, part science, part art. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. For, uh, by, just for the record, it's a LEED certified uh, at the gold level. <laughs> and uh, we, Congratulations. we thought, you know, I think in the planning process, they really wanted to do platinum, but there's even, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's a, a cost benefit ratio there, as you, as you know. So, Molly, uh, you have the honor of the first question. Molly Williamson. Um, th oh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, fascinating presentation. Um, could you um, say a word about the role of uh, government incentives for promoting uh, energy efficiency? Uh, we are, in the United States, now wrestling with the unintended consequences of incentivizing and, in some cases, mandating the use of ethanol, for example. Uh, can, you, can you talk about how this skews the market or, or how this uh, is comparable to other subs subsidies for other forms of energy? Um. Our, our basic view uh, is the following, or let's just say a personal view. Uh, um, not all energy efficiency investments make sense. Um, um, but there's a, there are a, uh, we're leaving, and that was reflected in that, in that uh, table, we're leaving a lot of energy efficiency investments that do make sense on the table. We're not doing it. Um, so we have to be very careful in terms of de developing government incentives for investments in energy efficiency that they're properly targeted and the like. 
Having said that, and I'll, and I'll analogize to the renewables, um, I think what we've seen in the renewables market, in particular, for example, in Germany, well, obviously, clearly in Spain, is arguably uh, is overinvestment. And the question, in some ways, becomes it's very difficult to hit it right on the mark. So it kind of depends where your tolerance level is going to be. Are you going to be more concerned about underinvestment or are you going to be more concerned about overinvestment? Our, our basic sense, when we look at the energy efficiency markets, uh, and in particular, given what's happening on the climate change side and the climate change needs, is we are significantly underinvesting. And so we need to figure out a way uh, to increase those investments, but recognizing not all energy, invest, energy efficiency investments make sense under all conditions, and so we have to be smart about it. Thank you, Phil. It was an excellent overview. Um, one of the fundamental challenges to energy efficiency is whether the market will take cost-effective measures on its own. Um, the McKinsey study of 2009 and other studies have documented fairly successfully that there are a lot of profitable energy efficiency opportunities that aren't taken. Um, and your study seems to say we're going to rely on the energy efficiency market to achieve the benefits. There seems to be a bit of a market failure going on. Perhaps it's lack of information. Perhaps it's split incentives. Perhaps it's other kinds of barriers. Um, does your report get to the recommendation of policies um, that would address some of those barriers and help us at least achieve the cost effect of energy efficiency? Okay, thank, you, thank you for that question, because I think uh, that gives me an opportunity to, to, to clarify something. What we tried to do very much uh, in terms of this market report was to be agnostic, agnostic in terms of uh, objectives and, and the like. So uh, I ended in the middle, I said thank you, and then I went into some of the why of why we decided to do it, and also why one reason I decided to do it. Now, I must admit, I should admit that I'm the head of the Energy Efficiency and Environment Division, <laughs> and there are three units in there. So a, a big part of my work is to look at this issue from, from the climate change perspective, but not only from the climate change perspective. We really didn't want to go, we didn't want to write another piece that, as we've done in the past, on what are good policies. We, we, we wanted to avoid that. We've done a lot of work on what are good policies. We wanted to write a piece, and we didn't totally achieve it, and we hope to do a better job on how much money is in here. What are we talking about in terms of supply and demand? Just like we would talk about in terms of the oil side. How big is the oil market? What's investing? Where's, where are we expecting it to go in terms of demand? So very much trying to disassociate uh, the issue of why you might be motivated uh, to invest in energy efficiency from what is actually happening in terms of investments in, in energy efficiency. So, Phil, in the past, was it your division that did the energy technology perspectives uh, publication? No, so it's the other division within, within my director, but we were, we're but very close. That, if I'm correct, that had a lot of policy. Uh, okay, so, right. no, actually, interesting enough, so uh, my division is responsible for energy efficiency policies. Okay. So we have something called, for example, policy pathways, which are basically lay out in certain uh, defined areas what are a variety, of, what policy pathway you should follow to implement policy. So we've done them on a variety of issues. We just issued one on building energy codes. We've done one on urban transport. Uh, my division is responsible for the 25 policy recommendations of the IEA, which covered a variety of sectors. The fact of the matter is the following. Uh, let me put it another, another way. And I'm going to go into climate, because it's, I, I think in some sense it's, it's related. Um, energy efficiency, there are a lot of benefits from energy efficiency that we are leaving on the table. And that's too bad. That's a shame. The problem is, if you then feel that uh, people's uh, expectations on the climate side and where we need to be in terms of uh, emissions are credible, you find yourself in a situation where energy efficiency goes from being a very nice thing to have into an imperative. And what we see is when we compare that imperative, if you trust like the IEA scenario analysis and you believe the scientists who believe that, compared to what's going on, you see a major gap. So then that raises the question for us because one of my, I'm responsible for energy efficiency, is 
okay, what can we do to scale up? So we're already doing policy analysis at the IA. We do a variety of scenario analysis with the EUE on the ETP and the like. We try to promote uptake of new technologies. But at the end of the day, we're kind of repeating ourselves. And we're saying the same thing we've been saying for years, maybe louder and with more support, but fundamentally it isn't changing that much. So we said to ourselves, is there a way of changing the nature of the conversation around energy efficiency? And we view very much the idea, for example, of trying to position energy efficiency more clearly in people's minds as an alternative to other fuels as a way of changing the discourse around energy efficiency so that it moves from the area of technocratic policy specialists more into the mainstream, just like, just like renewables did. And I know uh, there's a review of the U.S. energy policy uh, coming up, or I think uh, early next year. So I'm assuming that uh, someone from your staff will, will be part of that, and energy efficiency, I'm sure, will play in a prominent role in the, in that review. So if I could, before going that, but if I could just make that give an illustration on that. So I said, I'm, I'm from I'm from New York. You know, it, it's always interesting. I, for me, uh, in this, we don't question so much issues relating to defense. If it's defense, we don't really do uh, always a detailed cost-benefit analysis. There's a sense of this makes sense. And in different countries, they have these different type of objectives. And, and what we find, some people are very motivated by the, the, the climate change objective. You know, uh, I work with many emerging economies that are sort of like, that's, you know, the OECD countries created that problem, whether it's true or not, it's not our problem. So what we see is at the end of the day that different countries have different interests, different stakeholders have different interests, but under our analysis, we need to see a significant increase in energy efficiency. Renewables are on track under our analysis. The growth in renewables is sufficient to get us toward two degrees. Uh, the change in the energy efficiency market is not on track. John? Oh, then uh, you're next after that, John. Hi, uh, Steve Rosensack, As Electric Institute. Just uh, kind of curious, you're talking about doing more countries. Are you thinking about doing countries where energy is very heavily subsidized, like countries like Venezuela, where I think the price of gasoline just went up to 15 cents a gallon, and certain countries in the Middle East where electricity is about 0.0, .0 cents a kilowatt hour, and just kind of, you know, you're, you're talking about global markets. Well, those are markets where basically people are persuaded to use as much as you want because it's seen as a, I'll say, a good thing for their society and kind of the other, you know, that, that's also the other side is that some of these countries are just trying to push as much energy use because there is such surplus and they don't really care about the future in a way. So just in terms of your 2014, any thoughts about looking at those countries and maybe the other, unfortunately, the anti-effect of that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a valid question. So um, at the IA, as you're probably familiar, we spend a lot of time on the whole issue of fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, if you almost see any IEA publication, we always identify that uh, as a major issue that's having a distortionary impact on uh, oil consumption and the like. Uh, and we feel also what happens is it obviously undermines energy efficiency. Uh, uh, and to, it's increasing the amount of consumption. Uh, and then the other thing is it's obviously it's also making uh, energy efficiency uh, operations not relatively cost effective. You know, one of the drivers I put up there when we were talking the U.S. in a slightly different context was uh, prices to end users. So clearly in a heavily subsidized uh, market, the consumers don't have the same incentive to, to carry energy efficiency. Um, so as a general proposition, that's an issue uh, that we're raising. And so, for example, um, we are working, we prepared this 25 policy recommendations on energy efficiency that was targeted at IEA member countries. Uh, and we've done some outreach to other parts of the world, and we did one in the MENA region, the more Middle East, North Africa region, where one of the recommendations that came out was you need to look at uh, 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 fossil fuel subsidies if you want to be serious about moving ahead on energy efficiency. But I do want to come back and sort of say um, the market report fits in a portfolio of activities, um, and it's designed to serve, uh, to meet a certain purpose. And part of the purpose it's not designed to meet is, is, is to sort of say, what are good policies? Uh, having said that, clearly fossil fuel subsidies will have an impact on the market. 
I noticed early on you had that graph that showed the expenditures on energy efficiency. I was, quite frankly, very surprised to see how high that number was relative to expenditures on oil, gas, et cetera. Uh, are those public and private expenditures? And what went into that and in which countries? Because I don't believe in the U.S. our expenditures on energy efficiency are anything close to our net outlay for, for energy supply. Okay, so um, just to, clarif to clarify one, one point, right? Um, it's not how much money is being, it's relative to on the investment side, right? As opposed to the consumption side in the United States of, on fuel. The way, we, the way we generated the figures, and it's described in this, it's actually consistent with what was in the WIO 2012 as well, um, is that uh, in particular a variety of multilateral institutions and public sector institutions do estimates as to what they think was the leverage uh, of their uh, uh, monetary outlays. And so that $300 billion is based on figures that we got that have been refined since last year from a variety of, of uh, multilateral and bilateral institutions uh, and the type of leverage that they see. And that's on their, on, for example, lines of credits uh, and the like. And that's how we generated that figure. Um, and it's described in here with all its, with a recognition of all its shortcomings. And as I said, it's totally consistent as well with the, the figures we had last year in our WIO report. This is an area where we would like to improve uh, our data collection and our, methodologi our, 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 the method our methodological approach. Uh, so we very much, you know, I want to stress this is an inaugural report and we want to improve uh, the quality uh, in both those respects going forward. Having said that, it was interesting sort of reading some of the press coverage that came out, and one of them talked about is it high or is it low, and, and so far it hasn't sounded crazy to people. I will say from my own perspective, I think it's actually probably low um, because you have a variety, you know, again, if you go back to the cafe standards and the like, you have, you know, all these cars where you have improvements on, on, on fuel efficiency standards uh, and the like, a variety of buildings and things like that. There are a variety of expenditures. So. Right. The use of probably the best one is the refrigerator, right, as, the, as, as they become more efficient and even sometimes the cost come down. Uh, understood, but uh, that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And in fact, I think there's a lot of benefit uh, in trying for the reason that's reflected in the last graph I, sh I showed. I mean, when the WIO report came out last year in, in 2012 and the big story in the press was about energy uh, independence as a result of unconventional uh, gas and oil. There was very little discussion about the fact that 45 percent of that result was from energy efficiency interventions. So that's part of the mindset that I think we need to change just by giving people facts. Uh, to what extent did you uh, break things down into various sectors such as buildings, industry, transportation? Okay. Um, so we, we broke it down into sectors uh, in a section that uh, gives an update on some of the performance in terms of improvements in energy efficiency. So what we have uh, is we have an initial section that describes what's happening at, an, uh, at a macro level. And so those figures are basically macro figures and they're, you know, you look at an economy, you look at its energy intensity, you look at it 30 years later, you look at its energy intensity, you look at how much they're actually consuming, you sort of look at certain structural changes between the economies, you figure out how much of that difference probably comes from energy efficiency. So we do that at an aggregate level for a very limited number, uh, number of countries. Then the other thing we, uh, we do uh, that we've done as a general proposition is we do our indicators work. And in our indicators work, we show what has been the shift in certain key sectors. And so in this report, the uh, thing that our data people liked is that this report provides a good vehicle for them to get some of their information out. And so we have a section that looks at improvements in industry across, I think, 15 of the IA member countries, looks at transport, uh, uh, commercial transport, uh, looks at uh, freight transport and the like. And we will continue in each of the reports uh, to provide more information on indicators. The funny thing about indicators is you know, indicators don't reflect the market. So we, we always have 
we always have this problem, which is on the, on the one hand, every time you start talking about energy efficiency, we start moving into more of a policy approach as opposed to moving more into a dollars approach. But that's our challenge. You mentioned, I think, that Japan and South Korea were examples of some efficient economies or m making investments there. Is the reason really because of the price of energy in those countries versus other, other government incentives? And for countries that do not have high, high prices of energy, have, do you have any data on what works for kind of middle-of-the-road uh, economies and countries? Um, I think the answer that, to that in part is, is uh, my sense of Japan is it's actually not driven by prices directly. Uh, it's relevant. Uh, it's, it's more that Japan imports so much of its energy. So it, Japan is totally vulnerable uh, because of its import situation, which obviously has an impact on prices, but in some ways is almost more fundamental than prices. So actually Japan, for many, many years in many areas, has been a leader in terms of energy efficiency uh, interventions. And I think we're seeing that a little uh, with Korea. Now, the other thing that's interesting is to see uh, Korea, as well as with Japan, focusing on those aspects where it's high-level technological improvements related to appliances and things like that, because that also, I think, fits in with probably some other um, uh, geopolitical uh, strategies they have in terms of, you know, Samsung, Sony, and those type of those type of companies, uh, and I think in some ways, what your 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 question, or in some ways, m my response to your question reflects goes back to my point about the multiple benefits. Energy efficiency has a variety of benefits, and also why people are doing promoting energy efficiency policies are also driven by a variety of different consideration that go far beyond simply the question of of price. If I could just make one other point in that regard. It's interesting, if you think about the IEA, when did the IEA, why did the IEA come into existence? Because of the oil shock. I mean, and that was, I mean, I remember that. That was more than just a price issue. That was waiting on lines for, to, get, to get gasoline. So uh, Japan, for many, many years, has been, a, has been ahead of the curve when it comes to energy efficiency, and I think for security issues more than anything else. Is uh, China participating in many of the uh, activities you have with the countries outside of the IEA in, in terms of especially of energy efficiency? Or, yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, the IEA has been changing over time, as you, as you know well, um, because uh, basically while it started off as an OECD organization to, to protect the OECD countries against uh, OPEC activities, uh, what we have seen in particular over the last 20 years that is going to continue over the next 20 to 30 years is a shift in terms of how much of uh, energy is being consumed uh, within OECD members versus emerging economies like, like China and India. So um, as a result, uh, the IEA as a general proposition has increased its outreach and its engagement uh, with non-member countries, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, and the like, recognizing, uh, in particular for most energy markets, maybe less energy efficiency, but for most energy markets, uh, what happens in those countries will have a major impact in terms of price and security of supply and the like. Uh, so uh, we have a very, we're, we're trying to be very proactive in trying to engage uh, with those countries. And actually, uh, there are some efforts to try to create a more formal bond uh, with those countries. Uh, on energy efficiency, we've done some stuff. Uh, a lot of it's driven, for example, when you talk about China, by what the Chinese are interested. We did a publication called Saving Electricity in a Hurry, which talked about how you can respond to a short-term interruption of electricity, and we did a presentation uh, in China uh, on that regard. But we've been active, actually, believe it on the climate change front with the Chinese, maybe more than the energy efficiency side. Well, when you look at the local pollution issues. I mean, I don't know how much more motivation uh, both the public and the, and the government would, would have, you know, than what's been going on in the, the uh, most uh, densely populated areas in, in China. So, well, are there, uh, if there are any uh, final questions or comments for Philip? I 
almost said Philippe. <laughs> Still haven't gotten right. If not, well, oh, yes, ma'am. Last one's always the, the toughest Hello. one. So. <laughs> Does this report have any projections on how investments in clean coal technologies, such as CTL, um, would have or could improve the efficiency in the transportation sector? That's my question. <laughs> Investments in clean coal technologies and how it could potentially improve the uh, um, transportation sector's efficiency. Uh, sorry. No, so uh, we don't deal with that issue directly. I mean, to be frank, in some ways, your, your question, I think, touches on some of the complexities of the various linkages across, uh, I don't know, even I'm thinking of some of the linkages, power sector into electric vehicles and, and the like. So we haven't really focused in on some of those linkages in this particular report. To be frank, we're having, a, we're having enough problems to try to just sort of define what energy efficiency in the most traditional sense uh, looks, looks like in the improvements. Well, thank you all once again for uh, coming here this afternoon. Thanks to Annie Hudson and uh, Fernando Ferreira for assisting and putting this meeting together, and especially to Phil Benoit for uh, traveling from uh, Paris to present this uh, inaugural outlook uh, or market up report from uh, energy efficiency. I think it's a great initiative and uh, look forward to, uh, to hearing from you next year. Thanks, Phil, and uh, please join me in thanking Phil.